Dominus Fobiscum. Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Mateo. Jesus said to his disciples, In praying, do not babble like the pagans, who think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. Your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This is how you are to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. If you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your transgressions. Verbum Domini It is a great joy to be with all of you this morning, and I'll tell you just, I've been asked the question several times in the last couple days, so how did you get signed up to be here this week? And and it was, it's a great question. I mean, you look at some of the names on there, I have the books of some of the people that are on there, uh, and it's a great, beautiful thing, and yet, you're not going to find any of my books in the gift shop later today. Because I haven't written any, so uh, it's going to be hard to buy any of those. Now, I'm, I'm very blessed in that I have some dear friends that are immediately to my left, the poor Claires of Perpetual Adoration, who some of them spent a little bit of time in Charlotte, North Carolina, which is my diocese. I am Father John Ecker, for those of you who haven't seen the flyer. I'm the pastor of Sacred Heart Catholic Church in Salisbury, North Carolina, where I have been since 2014. And it's been so great. I got here on, let's see, what day was that? I got here on Tuesday evening. And just to be in this beautiful place, and in the midst of that time, in the good way that our Lord does, I mean, I've already met some new wonderful friends, some of the pilgrims on the big national a Eucharistic Congress pilgrimage like my new friend, Brother Damiano, and the other pilgrims that are with him, like Father Mark behind me. Yesterday I had the great honor of celebrating Mass with Father Joseph downstairs in the Crypt Church. And I just have to tell you, for those of us who have grown up with EWTN, at least like part of our life, like in the background, somewhere there all the time, I just thought my grandma O'Brien would be very happy that I was getting to celebrate Mass with Mother Angelica so close. And I see some of my friends, the sister servants of the Eternal Word that are here. I mean, friends new and old, and therein lies the great beauty of our faith. You know, our Lord is constantly giving us all the time, giving us so much, more and more, every single day. And he doesn't want us to babble, right? He doesn't want us to just kind of, like think that we've got to earn his love and get it by like all the things we say and do. We've got to do this all the time. We're always excited and always upset and da, da, da. No, what does he want? He wants us to be his children, to love him, to know the fact that he is always there and he is always giving us more and more and more. There's a couple of things that I really want to hit on as we look at, I mean, this amazing gospel today, right? Like I, I was very intentional as I was reading this, not just enchanting the beginning and the ending in Latin, which I don't normally get to do. And I got to tell you, I was so happy when you all responded in the correct way. I was like, okay, I did it correctly. Thanks be to God. And, you know, we're all in this together. As I was saying to uh, Father Mark and Cecil, Father Cecil as well, who's with us today, 
before the mass. It's like, before you go into the Super Bowl, you don't put on a new pair of cleats. You know, it's like I'm used to doing things a certain way. And so it's like, okay, we're going to do this. It's going to be great, folks. We're going to make it. It's going to be awesome. But then it's like you go, like normally I don't get to say Dominus Obiscum in this beautiful way. And then we go to the Our Father, right? We all know the Our Father. How many times have we said it already today? And yet, to slow down for a few minutes and just to recognize that this is a divinely inspired prayer. These are the words that Jesus Christ, the second person, the most holy trinity, the son of God, the word made flesh, who has dwelt among us, has given us to pray. And just to stop with that and to think about it and that we have this awesome gift in this prayer and to recognize that our father wants us to have so many treasures constantly and all the time. It points us towards the fact that God knows what we need. And in the midst of our faiths, like we hold together these two aspects of just like awesome awe, right? Like in a few minutes, I'm going to get to say, you know, we dare to say our Father who art in heaven because we're in awe at the great majesty of God at who has come to us, right? And I mean, obviously, in this particular place, it's a little bit easier to be in awe. I mean, I'm excited to look with you at this awesome sanctuary. And I'll tell you, this is the first time I've been on this side of the rail to get to step up here, to get to reverence this altar, to get to be in this place. You know, just the awe that is so inspired in all of this. And yet... Our Lord doesn't just want us to be in this like immovable paralysis of awe. In our faith, he also wants familiarity. Now, I don't mean familiarity like breeding contempt. I mean, I don't mean we take him for granted. But that we see the fact that God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son. That that only begotten son has taught us prayers like the Our Father that he wants us praying them over and over again, that he wants these words on our lips and in our hearts, that he wants us to be familiar with him and to be familiar with one another, that we have this great glory of being in awe that he is with us and yet to recognize that he wants to be with us. I'll tell you one of the things about, you know, the, who are you? You know, I'm a, I'm a parish priest And I'm grateful for that. I think it's what I was made for. And to be there in a parish all the time, to see the ways that God is constantly giving us different gifts, you know, right on the ground, right where, you know, the church is, right? I mean, the parish, that's where all these things happen. And we're very blessed at Sacred Heart. We have many, many servers. And I always tell them for serving, there are two rules. And the guys know them pretty well. The first one, be reverent. The second one, don't burn the church down. So as long as they follow that first rule, they very typically follow the second, right? I mean, be reverent. Why? Because the mysteries that we serve are amazing, right? I mean, the fact that God has humbled himself to give us himself under the form of bread and wine, that a few moments Fathers Joseph and Mark and Cecil and I get to approach that altar and say the words that our Lord said on the night before he died, right? The night before he'd be, or the night on which he was betrayed by his friends, and yet what did he do? He gave us the greatest gift we could ever receive in his very self to the point that he wanted us to do this in remembrance of him. And how often? Let's look at a word that's almost confusing in the Our Father. Give us this day our what? our daily bread, right? Epiousios. Once again, I'm a parish priest, not a Greek scholar, but I do know this. Epiousios, it's one of those that's hard to translate. It's here translated daily, but if you get at it, it's like above the substance, super substantial. And I think as we think about that, We think about God himself giving us this prayer that we get to say so much. Giving us 
our daily bread, yes, that which we need for sustenance. If we were going to celebrate today the Mass of the 11th week of Ordinary Time, we just heard it on Sunday. If you've gone to daily Mass this week, we haven't had many saints, so you've probably heard it already. In the offertory, we talk about in this sacrament, you meet our twofold needs, sustaining us with food and with the sacraments. We have this epiousios. I don't even know if I'm quite saying it right. It's just like the Latin at the beginning. I apologize. I'm more of an English guy. I'm doing my best. But this, this bread that goes above and beyond, and yet it's still given to us daily. That in our faith, our Lord wants both awe and familiarity. That in this life, heaven is breaking in all of the time. And for those of us who have eyes to see, we can see it unfolding more and more. That today is another day to meet another best friend, right? Like I said, I'm so happy to get to see the poor Claires. I'm glad glad my friend Father Mark from Rapid City is here. We've known each other now for almost 48 hours. You know, it's amazing. We're even close enough friends that before Mass I could say, I'm terribly sorry about this and I'm totally embarrassed. What's your first name again? So it's, you know, one of those things where, but... Like we're always getting to meet new friends all of the time. And notice the beautiful words that this prayer begins with. Pater noster, noster, our Father, right? That our Lord wants us loving each other, delighting in his presence and delighting in one another's. And he keeps giving it to us day in and day out. We're blessed right now in a day like today that all of these things are intersecting. I was blessed to get to ask, or I was asked to do this, I don't know, I think over a year ago. And so at the time, there was no knowledge that there would also be a National Eucharistic Congress pilgrimage passing through Hansville, Alabama at the same time. But in God's good providence, that is the way these things work, my friends. And God is always working those sort of things out in his beautiful, glorious trajectory, right? And so what are we called to do? To keep showing up, to keep praying, to keep being in awe at the fact that our Lord reveals himself, gives us himself in a way that we're allowed to be familiar with. Not in a way that we take it for granted, right? Because in all reality, all of the different gifts we're being given all the time Really, anything that we're familiar with, we shouldn't just take for granted. Okay, this is probably not the best example, but remember COVID when all of a sudden toilet paper was more expensive than gold? Like those sort of things that we take for granted that all of a sudden are so important, right? We have so many things around us all of the time. And thanks be to God that as we come together on this day, to reflect on the fact that Jesus Christ is in our midst, that we have the opportunity all of the time to spend time with him. And as a sodality, right, as people that together get to say, our Father, that we know that throughout the world, as St. Peter reminds us in his letter, that the devil is prowling like a roaring lion, but resist him solid in your faith. Why? Because your brothers and sisters throughout the world They're going through the same thing. And our Lord, who induces awe and yet allows for familiarity, is in the midst of all of this with us all the time and continues to give us himself, the epiousios, this super substantial and yet daily bread. Jesus Christ is in our midst. And to get this opportunity together today, to step aside and to recognize that, to once again renew that awe that he is here and at the same time to thank him from the very depths of our being that we get to be familiar with him and to hold those two things together, to live our life in such a way that other people want to enter into that awe and that familiarity, to be in the midst of that peace, to be close to a God who gives us the words that we can say to him, that he's in the midst of everything all the time, how graced and blessed we truly are. And so at this time that is extra exciting, as we celebrate a National Eucharistic Congress, as we get to experience the stop on the pilgrimage route, we recognize the fact that, yes, this is special. 
And at the same time, this isn't the only day we get to do this because he has given us the daily bread. He continues to be with us today and every day. Whether we get to celebrate in this beautiful place, back in our home parishes, or wherever our Lord calls us to. So my brothers and sisters in Christ, I offer this Mass today for all those members of the Adoration Sodality, whether you are part of the St. Francis, the St. Clair, or the St. Anthony Guild, whichever you may be, that all of us may continue to grow in that awe that our Lord continues to be with us, to recognize that he wants to be familiar with us each and every day, and that all of us, as we pray to our Father, may continue to grow closer and closer to one another. As we grow closer to one another, we may ever grow closer to his most sacred and Eucharistic heart. Praise be Jesus Christ. Father Eckert is a cradle Catholic who grew up surrounded by family, friends, and clergy who exemplified what it meant to truly live the Catholic faith. This helped him discern his calling to the priesthood from a very young age. He graduated from St. Louis University in 2004 with a degree in political science and communication. He entered seminary soon afterwards, studying at the Potemphical College Josephinum in Ohio. In 2010, he was ordained a priest for the Diocese of Charlotte, North Carolina. And shortly after that, he and I met. Um, he has served as parochial vicar at Our Lady of Grace in Greensboro, North Carolina, and as pastor at St. John the Baptist in Tryon, North Carolina, the big horse town. We now, um, he now serves as pastor of Sacred Heart Catholic Church in Salisbury, North Carolina, where he has been in residence since 2014. In addition to his duties as pastor of Sacred Heart, he was appointed by his bishop to serve as the Vicar Ferrain, is that how you say that? Vicar Ferrain, of the Salisbury Vicariate, which is the same as a dean of a deanery. It's just a uh, different term. Um, and what is most notable and important too, like he said this morning at Mass, is that he is a very good friend of Mother Paschal and many of the sisters from the time they spent in the Diocese of Charlotte. And so we are very pleased and excited to welcome Father Eckert. Thank you so much. Thank you. You got it. Oh, perfect. I, and I open that one. Okay, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, indeed. Okay, here we go. I'm going to try. Okay, as I'm putting this on, I will try to fill the space and talk. Um, there we go. Okay. I should be an expert on these kind of microphones at this point because I've been a priest for 14 years. Um, Everybody hear me okay? Fantastic. I would say, can everybody hear me downstairs? Because I know that there's overflow seating downstairs. It's good to see everybody. Glad you're down there. Um, <laughs> wait, that sounded bad. I'm glad you're with us. <laughs> this is great. For, from my understanding of this, like, I think people heard about my healing abilities. I'm really good at curing people of insomnia. So today, it's going to be amazing. Like, I hope everybody's very comfortable. You're going to be even more comfortable in a few. 
Uh, let's start with a prayer, and then we will uh, dive into the talk. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for the gift of your perpetual, close, loving presence in the most blessed sacrament. We thank you today for the gift of the holy sacrifice of the Mass, for the gift of your continual presence, for the grace to never take you for granted, but to draw ever close to you in that more and more familiar way in awe that you are with us all of the time. And we ask this through the intercession of the one who is so close to you, who takes us by the hand and draws you closer to us every day. Our blessed mother, as we pray, remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession, was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. Most sacred heart of Jesus, immaculate heart of Mary, Saint Joseph, Saint Francis, Saint Clair. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, friends. Well, it's so good to be with you all. I have to be careful, and if I start moving too far, you just let me know. And, okay, I'm also really good at going over time. So, I'm going to do my best to keep it to where we need to be. If there's anybody that needs to tell me, Cindy, just start waving if we're getting within like five minutes, okay? Um, so, I'm thrilled to be here. And when I got asked to be here, as I said in the homily day months ago, um, we didn't know that this was also going to be National Eucharistic Congress uh, pilgrimage time and everybody coming together. And I'm just so thrilled to get to have so many new friends that we get to, to be together today. And it's always interesting when you get to do something like this, and as far as the talk topics are concerned, it said, we'd like you to talk on the Eucharist. Now, to be fair, that is a pretty huge topic, and there are like so many millions of different ways that we could go with that, you know? I mean, just the fact, like I was saying today, it's like that, that we can be familiar with God, right? That, that he makes himself present in all the tabernacles of the world, as we're going to pray later on at benediction. You know, we all get to go home to our home parishes. Like, I'll tell you this, I'm a huge fan of Our Lady of Fatima, of all the apparitions of Fatima. I've been back five times. I lead a pilgrimage there every year now. And a couple years back, I was there, and I was in that beautiful Basilica of the Holy Rosary. Um, like, if you're facing the Capilina to your right, it's the big, beautiful one right there. And I'm inside and just completely belly aching to our Blessed Mother, like, I don't want to go home, like, it's just so sad, and you know, like, because we, we get that way sometimes, you know, like, I mean, even today, think about where we are, I mean, I don't know you, like, I have a beautiful church, I love it so much, but I'll be honest, we don't have the amount of gold that there is, I guess, that way, you know, <laughs> you know? And, and my monstrance is not three feet taller than I am, so... <laughs> If it was, I'd be a lot more buff, right? Like, it's just one of those things, like, it's just the way that this is. I mean, and it's a glorious place, and I'll tell you, the last couple of days, uh, the weather has been incredible here. Yesterday, um, it, was, it was so nice. Like, it was like a retreat day for me. Uh, Susie Stokes, that's been emailing me, said, Father, when you come, you got to, like, set some time aside so you can just kind of be here. And I'll be honest with you, like, I feel like summer just started for me on Monday. We've had a really busy time in my parish, uh, in the diocese. We just got a new bishop back on May 29th, Bishop Michael Martin. Fantastic. I love the man. Pray for him. I mean, just, yeah, being ordained a bishop is a lot. And then two days after he was ordained, he ordained our six deacons. And then two weeks later, he ordained our seven priests. So we got the full scope of holy orders in two and a half weeks, which is amazing. And, you know, in the midst of that, we had our school graduation and everything that takes place with that. It's just been like, go, 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 go. Right up until, oh yeah, and one of those seven is a seminarian from my parish who is now Father Matthew Harrison. So we had his first Mass of Thanksgiving on Sunday. It's just awesome, right? So just like all of this awesome glory. And then like Monday, I was like, oh, and then I got to drive, you know, seven and a half hours to get here. But 
so good. And like yesterday, I got to just be here. And the people here are so amazing. I can see Luke through the window there. He's like the best hospitality guy you could ever meet. Like the people here have been so kind. And I got to just pray. And like yesterday morning, I was walking to come over to the chapel, and like the monastery church. And the weather was just so amazing. I sat on this little swing out there, and the wind was blowing, and it was just amazing. The Pieta there is glorious too. Anyway, like all this stuff to say, like, there's just so much goodness, right? And we could talk about so many different things uh, when it comes to the Eucharist. But the way that I thought we could kind of spend our time today, I've been thinking about the National Eucharistic Congress, right? And we have this, this huge, awesome event that is drawing so many people together from across the country. I mean, you think about the, the procession route that began in Brownsville, Texas, and is now here in Hansel, Alabama, and then they're moving on to Atlanta after this. And like all of us converging at this one point today, and we do need, you know, Eucharistic revival. We do need help sometimes with recognizing that the familiar, that what we have in our midst is so good and how blessed we are. But I think too, and I would say this, you know, as a parish priest, is that we have to make sure that this doesn't stay in the realm of a big event in Indianapolis, I mean, where everything happens in the United States, right? I can say that as someone who grew up in Peoria, Illinois. I'm not a big fan of Indiana, but we'll let that be. Um, <laughs> But, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, okay, that's going to be amazing. And then, what, it finishes up on, like, July 22nd. Okay, everybody, back to normal. Like, no. Like, to recognize that we have so much goodness in our midst. And so I'm just kind of thinking about, okay, what do we talk about today? And I thought trying to kind of bring together this time where we get to spend a little bit more time together and then the healing service later on. I want to take the opportunity to reflect on one of my favorite, we'll call it my favorite segments of sacred scripture. I am a huge fan of the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. I know that sounds like, wow, that's really specific, Father. But I will say this, as a standalone unit, I mean, it's awesome within the whole context of the Gospel of Mark, which is fantastic and, you know, like all the Gospels are. But chapter 10 wraps so many things together. And we're going to spend a little bit of time on one specific episode in that chapter this morning, and then more time later today on kind of the concluding episode in that chapter. But the overarching theme that I kind of see there is a lot of people kind of approaching our Lord with, I don't know, a little bit of cynicism, not thinking things can be as good as they are, settling for a lot of things that aren't so great, and okay, I'm going to go near the podium. Let's hope that it doesn't, like, give us all kinds of feedback. Can I do this? I'm afraid of it. Okay, we're okay. Nope, we can't. <laughs> Here is my spot. This is where it works. Okay. So, we begin with this, and I will tell you this. Because of our bishop's ordination, we had to move our graduation from May 29th, when it was originally scheduled, also his ordination. Just so you know, in the liturgical schedule of things, a bishop's ordination trumps an eighth grade graduation. I know it surprises you, but it does. And uh, so it turns out that this was the gospel for the mass for my eighth grade graduates. The beginning of the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. For those of you who are scripture scholars, you're already kind of chuckling. You ready? And he left there and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, and crowds gathered to him again. And again, as was his custom, he taught them. And Pharisees came up, and in order to test him, asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to put her away. Man, that is some tough phrasing, isn't it? But Jesus said to them, For your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one. So they are no longer two, but one. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Now, why do I start off with that today on a talk about the Eucharist? Okay, beginning of chapter 10, right? They're approaching him. Is it lawful to divorce a wife? No, 
Think about back to the beginning. This is the way it's supposed to be. I mean, this beautiful living icon of the love of God, of you know, man leaving his father and mother, being joined to his wife, new life coming out of it. It's supposed to be amazing. And, and you think about this, Jesus refers back to the beginning. From the beginning it was not so, because of the hardness of your hearts. Now, as I said on the day of eighth grade graduation, as all these families are there, I understand that bad marriages can happen to good people. That, you know, let's put it this way. When I was in seminary at the Pontifical College Josephinum, Dr. Perry Cahall, who is wonderful and is married, used to say to us seminarians, guys, you have the harder vocation to discern. We married people have the harder vocation to live. He said, when it, go, when it comes to you, if something goes wrong, it's your fault, right? I mean, you're, you're with God. Like, with us, it's two fallen human beings try to make this work out. Like, it's not an easy thing. And yet, from the beginning, God wanted it to be this way. And here's these Pharisees, like, ah, can't be real. And then, this is the thing that blows me away about this. Then later in the house, his disciples question him about this. These are the people that are close to him. These are the ones that are around Jesus all the time. Uh, Lord, you really mean that? Like, it's really possible? Yes, guys, it's really possible. And this is the thing in this chapter. The disciples, they don't always come out looking so good because it moves on to this. And they were bringing children to, him, children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. He took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands upon them. Our Lord loves us, loves us like little children. Doesn't like love us because we already have it all figured out, right? Like I will say this too, another great thing about being here with you all today is the fact of like the diversity of the crowd. And I mean specifically like diversity of ages, right? Like I see my little buddy Micah that I met a few minutes ago, and I think his brother Elijah is around here somewhere in the back. Yeah, like, you know, our average age here, I'm not really sure what it is. And that's exciting, right? Like, because the gospel, once again, familiar and awe. Like all of us get to come to our Lord with the comfort of going, you know, to our mother of going to our dad, like to get to be with him. And sometimes, you know, the disciples, no, leave Jesus alone. He has better things to do than be with your wonderful, sweet child. Like, you know, when we get to be that way, it's dangerous, right? And I think sometimes in our world, we can get cynical. We can get overwhelmed. We can stay so focused on all the things that are bad out there. Now, don't get me wrong. Even though the staff at my first parish used to accuse me of this all the time, I am not Pollyanna, I promise. Like, I'm not out there saying like, hey everybody, everything's as good as it can be, all the time. So stop being upset, turn that frown upside down everybody, no. <laughs> Sometimes we should have frowns, sometimes things are not amazing, however, you know, there are children, right? I got to meet my little buddy Steven, I think they ended up downstairs, I'm, again, hey everybody, sorry you're downstairs. But, <laughs> Like, you know, like we, we get to see all these wonderful people and to see, you know, children praying, to see them knowing, you know, that our Lord is in our midst. And unless, you know, we receive him like a little child, like we can't enter into the kingdom of heaven, to trust in him is so good, right? And I think once again, it's like our Lord dismantling cynicism, dismantling things like, no, it can't really be that good. You know, things can't really be that great. And once again, our Lord is here telling us, no, they really can. Now, the next episode, one of my favorites in all of the Gospels, it's recorded in, in Matthew and Luke as well. However, Mark's is my favorite of them all, and I'll tell you why in a second. You're going to know exactly what I'm talking about here in just a moment. So, he's already had the conversation about divorce. He's already had the conversation about letting the children come to him. Then we get this. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have observed from my youth. And Jesus, looking upon him, loved him. And said to him, You lack one thing, 
Go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. At that saying, his countenance fell, and he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. I want to just kind of linger on that episode for a while. Because the thing is, you know, who of us, you know, it's like we should all be asking the same question. Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You know, and of course, our, and I love, you know, why do you call me good? No one's good but God alone. Like, do you understand who you're talking to here, buddy? You are talking to God, to God incarnate, to the second person of the most holy trinity, who, you know, is loving him at the very moment. And then, you know, you know the commandments, right? And over these last couple of days, for all of us who go to daily mass, we've been getting the Sermon on the Mount, you know, where our Lord is giving us, you know, these beautiful antitheses, as they call them. Where it's like, okay, you have been taught, but I tell you, you know, Moses gave you this, but I want more for you than what Moses wanted for you. I can give to you more than what Moses gave to you. Moses had, you know, stone tablets, you know, that were written on by the finger of God, but God's not content to merely have stone with his law of love written on it. He wants to write his law of love on our hearts. He wants us to be living this out to the full, right? And so you start off, you know, with the commandment like, you know, you, you know the commandments, do not kill, right? Well, we just heard, was it last week, I think, from the Sermon on the Mount, you know, you have heard it said, you shall not kill, but I tell you, whoever is angry with his brother in his heart has already murdered him. Okay, it's like, whoa, Lord, like, I thought you were here to throw everything out. It's like, no, 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 I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill it. And let's just stop on that one for a second, right? You shall not kill. I mean, we live in an age that, I don't know, I think you could, you could classify our age as pretty ticked off all the time, which is funny because right now we are standing in a medieval castle, right? Like, to think about the fact that at this moment in time, we are probably more physically comfortable than has ever happened, right? Like, I mean, even when you think about road rage, right? It's like, I'm so upset. And yet, I potentially have a seat ventilator cooler thing that is like cooling me down while I'm listening to whatever in the world I want, be it Fulton Sheen or, I don't know, the gin blossoms. Like, I'm just throwing it around. Like, I don't, you know, we can listen to whatever we want all the time. And, you know, it's like our cars are incredibly comfortable. And yet, we're still completely ticked off, right? Like, I can order things from Amazon and receive them yesterday, and yet <laughs> I'm still upset about everything, right? Like, it's amazing how this stuff happens. What does our Lord want? He wants us to go above and beyond. He wants us to be fulfilled. He doesn't want us to be stuck in those problems. I mean, you think about yesterday, we got the same gospel that we get on Ash Wednesday. You know, when you pray, go to your inner room and pray in secret. And your father, who sees you in secret, will repay you. And the thing is, I, I've kind of come to this realization over time. I think the repayment, it's already happening, right? Like, it's not like, okay, Lord, I prayed my rosary, so I'm expecting like 15 grace points here. Like, come on. <laughs> like, I think it's one of those things, it's like the very act of going to spend time with your grandmother is in itself a treasure, right? The very act of doing the things that our Lord wants us to do, the very act of not killing, of letting go of revenge and hatred in our hearts. I love that saying that, you know, holding on to a grudge is like taking poison and expecting the other person to get sick, right? Because if we go around all the time gritting our teeth and being upset about, Father, do you not know about the state of the world? Yeah, I, I too am a human being, right? Like, I know the old things they ain't what they used to be, right? Okay, fine. <laughs> but at the same time, it's like, what is me gritting my teeth and being perpetually ticked off gonna do about it, right? Like, our Lord wants us to be fulfilled. He wants the law of his love to be written on our hearts. Now, that doesn't mean, hey, I'm okay, you're okay, you do you, I'll do me. No, there is a moral law, right? I mean, we know, as I think it's St. Augustine who coined it, you know, love the sinner, hate the sin. And if there's anybody who does that so perfectly, 
It's our Lord. I don't know if anybody here ever reads The Catholic Thing. I highly recommend it. They put out an essay every day. The one for today by Dr. Michael Pakalik was all about this. Like, is righteous anger possible? And wait a second, what about when Jesus cleared out the temple? Like, he's okay, yeah. But notice, he doesn't like beat any of the people up, right? It's not like, you, you are awful. It doesn't say, you know, uh, Mr. I don't know, like, I'm going to talk later on about blind Bartimaeus, right? It's not like they have Simon the seller of things in the temple, and like he beats that guy. No. Yes, he weaves together a cord of reeds. He says, stop making my father's house a marketplace, right? He overtips the table. The coins go all over the place. He doesn't like the situation. He wants things to be better. There are things that are going to make us upset, and they should make us upset. There's, you know, the horrible attacks against the dignity of human life. I have a feeling that everyone in this room, and downstairs, has done work, right, in the pro-life ministry, striving to help people. But the way that the world so often makes it look is like we're a bunch of angry people that want to stamp on people's pride and blah, 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 blah. No. Why for all this? Because I want you to be happy. I want you to be fulfilled. I want you to know the fulfillment that I have. Don't do something you'll regret for the rest of your life. And so it's one of those things where, yes, angry at the injustice, at the bad situations that are out there, just like our Lord. But notice, right to the very end, from the cross, what does our Lord say? I'm getting you, Longinus. No. He says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And yes, everyone in this room, at some, and downstairs, has, has been hurt at some point, right? We've all experienced hurt. And I would say this too. This is where we've got to go to our Blessed Mother, Our Lady of Sorrows. It's a lot easier, in my opinion, to forgive someone that's hurt me than to forgive someone who's hurt my loved ones, right? Now, I don't have children of my own. Uh, my sister has seven and is pregnant with number eight right now. If any of them get hurt, I'm going to have a hard time forgiving, you know? Like, I know about my niece having a tough time in the class. I'm glad I don't know the kid that's giving her a hard time. I mean, would be like, Ugh. you know, but those are the harder people to forgive, right? But what do we do by holding on to that anger? Nothing. We, we just, it's like using the devil's tools to fight the devil. It's a trap, right? And our Lord ultimately wants so much better for us than that. What's the next one? You know, you shall not commit adultery. Okay, here it is. Like, you know, same thing. We heard from our Lord the other day. You've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, anyone who's lusted after a woman in his heart has already committed adultery. Here's the thing, too. We are surrounded by all sorts of, like, you know, imagery and fake stuff, especially, you know, on the Internet. I mean, we live in an age where it's just like this stuff. It's an epidemic. It's all over the place. But what does our Lord want? What he told us about a minute ago, from the beginning, it was not so. You know, a husband, you know, leaves his mother and father, is joined to his wife, and the two become one. Yes, we are longing for union. And there's a lot of fake image of that out there, Right? There's a lot of like promises of like being fulfilled in that way. It cannot deliver. And ultimately, why is it that our Lord wants us to be away from those things? It's not because he wants us to be alone. It's because he wants us to be fulfilled. He wants us to know the kind of love that he has come to give us. Not mere passing pleasure. Not isolation. He wants us to be free to make a self-gift, right? He wants us to love him him. And in turn, he wants us to love in the way that he's called us to in our vocation. Whether we be celibate, like profess religious or us priests. Whether we be married, right? And bring new life into the world. Regardless, for all of this, it's because he wants us to live it to the full, right? And he wants us to do it like him. And so he gives us those kind of commandments. And I'll just, you know, talking about those two, because it moves on to not defrauding, not stealing. Uh, with any of those things. Why is he giving us this? Because he is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. He doesn't want us to be like the father of lies. He wants us to mean what we say. He wants us to, to be the kind of people that follow up and do good things. I got a good friend. It's, it's fun with us priests, like sometimes talking about different things we've said in confession. Not talking about people's sins. We're not going to violate the seal, I promise. But like my one buddy was telling me about you know, sometimes when people come to him and say, you know, Father, I told some white lies. <laughs> He'll say, you know what that makes you? A liar. And I, I really enjoy that. 
because I think sometimes we can sort of like give ourselves a pass. It's like, well, you know, I had to tell that lie. Did you? Did you have to tell that lie? I mean, you know, there are ways to work at things, but it's, you know, we want to tell the truth, right? We want to be able to be like our Lord in living in a fulfilled way where we don't have to put up masks, you know, where, where we're living totally free. And that's what he wants for us. Honor your father and your mother. I love how he goes from, you know, a few of the prohibitions. We get, you know, number five, number six. We move down, the, down a little bit, and then he skips back up to number four. Honor your father and your mother. Are they perfect? Are they saints? No. And we all know that, right? I mean, I have the awesome privilege of being called father. I know personally. I am not perfect. But nevertheless, like, honoring those who have come before us. Why is that so important? Because it's like we're, we're part of this whole ongoing unfolding of salvation history. We all stand on the shoulders of giants, right? Like, and I, like I said in, in the homily earlier today, I was really thinking about that last night as I had the awesome privilege of celebrating with Father Joseph in the presence of Mother Angelica, you know? And, and just to have that and remembering being in my grandparents' living room and like watching EWTN with them. And now I get to be the priest that's here. If they hadn't done what they did and handed it on to my mom, right? And same thing with my dad's parents, you know, on to him. Like, I wouldn't be standing here dressed like this, talking to you, putting you all to sleep. I mean, it's one of those things where it's just like amazing what happens. And to honor that, right? Not to like focus in on everything they did wrong, right? It's like, well, okay, then we should focus in on everything you do wrong, which is what the devil likes to do, right? Whereas our Lord... Notice what comes next. Well, all of these I've kept from my youth. Okay. Notice what he does. And this is why I love St. Mark's version the most. And looking at him, he loved him. And that's why I really wanted to spend time with that this morning on a talk about the Eucharist. What is he doing in the Eucharist? Especially in adoration. And looking at us, and looking at you, right? And I love, because he uses the you, the second person singular so often. And looking at you. He loves you. And in the same way I said before, I've got, I'm so blessed to have many nieces and nephews, right? And I don't love them because of what they can do for me, right? It's like, wow, now that Daisy, my sister's oldest, can mow the lawn, now, now I really like her a lot, you know? <laughs> it's like, no. I mean, it's just, <laughs> I love her because she's her, you know? And, and it's, I mean, yes, it's, it's wonderful when everything's going great, we're getting along, all this kind of, but I mean, I'm going to love her regardless. And to get to just be with her and be in her presence. And this is the amazing thing when it comes to the Eucharist. He delights in you, you know. Um, I was blessed this past Sunday on the 11th Sunday of Ordinary Time. You know, I talked about the second reading from St. Paul where it talks about, you know, we strive to please him, right? And why do we strive to please him? We'll stop for a second and think about him. In the Gospel this past Sunday from Mark 4, you know, Jesus talked about the parable of the sower goes out and sows seeds, and they grow overnight. He goes to sleep night and day. It's growing. He knows not how. First the blade, then the ear, then the grain in the air, then the harvest time. Like, God is always, like, just giving more and more and more all the time. And I quoted uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle from Sherlock Holmes talking about the flowers, right? It's one of those things. You're not going to see Sherlock Holmes very often talking eloquently about theology. But there's one in particular. It's called the Naval Treaty. And, I mean, not to give it away, he wrote it 130 years ago, so you've had a chance to read it. But it works out, okay? And it works out in this, this one episode because of, like, this amazing providence. And in the end, Sherlock Holmes is, like, kind of glancing out the window. And Watson's amazed by this. He's like, oh, we see so much in the flowers. What? And it's like, here's the thing. You know, we need food, we need our reason, we need different things just for pure existence. But the flowers, they're extras. We don't need their smell, we don't need their beauty, and yet, for whatever reason, God has given us flowers, right? They are extras. And Sherlock Holmes says, and I trust in the goodness of providence because of the extras. We have a God of extras, right? Like the breeze yesterday morning, like I said, it was, I can't think of a better word than delicious, which sounds really kind of weird, but it was just, it was. It was so amazing. Does it have to be that way? No. And yet, he delights in us. 
And so what I would say, especially in this time of Eucharistic revival, is that I think if we're going to carry on and keep going with what's been happening in Indian, or what's going to happen in Indianapolis, what's been happening with our wonderful pilgrims, thank you for the sacrifices, keep it going, it's amazing. Uh, you know, the goodness that's happening with that, if we're going to keep that going, what do we have to recognize? He looks at us and he loves us, right? Because I think too often in this world, it's easy to forget that. We get into this like battle mentality. Now, don't get me wrong. I know that we are in a spiritual battle. I mean, we're in St. Michael's castle, for goodness sake, right? But when you think about St. Michael, what does he say? Who is like God? And I think one of the biggest things and ways that we defeat the devil is with joy, right? That we don't go around always sorrowful and upset. Now, there are things that cause sorrow, and yet we know that our Lord has ultimately conquered, right? That we need to be like a St. Lawrence who is laid on the gridiron and is able to say, turn me over, I'm done on this side. Because I think that kind of joy in the most difficult of situations can go so far, right? I love, and I haven't heard the fullness of the story, but I heard a little bit from Father Mark that in one of the stops with the Eucharistic pilgrimage, you know, it, it says on the bus, I actually took a picture of it because it's such a cool bus, but like, you know, it says Eucharistic pilgrimage and someone came up and said, what's a Eucharist, you know? And now there are ways to respond to that. How do you not know? It's been 2,000 years. And you, okay, <laughs> that's one way, right? But if you get to meet a joyful person like a Father Mark, right, or a Brother Damiano, or these wonderful pilgrims, and they look at someone like, let me tell you, it's the greatest treasure in the world. Why? Because Jesus looks at us and loves us, right? And to be able to say like, okay, hey, I know, you know, you may have a sola scriptura argument. You may have this, you may have that. We got it all. Like, and I say that, you know, with all due humility. I say that, you know, as someone who gets to dress like this, right, who gets to be called father, like, I want everybody to get to be close to him. Why? Because like that rich young man, I've experienced him looking at me and loving me. And that's a real thing. And you think about something like this Eucharistic sodality, right? Whether you are in the once a month St. Anthony Guild, the once a week St. Clara Guild, the everyday St. Francis Guild, no matter how much, because you know this is the thing, when it comes to spiritual practices, our Lord meets us where we are. It's okay. Even if you're not in the sodality, even if you're here because, hey, this seems like a fun thing to do today. Let's just be there, you know? Even if you're downstairs and you know you're not upstairs right now, it's okay. Like, no matter where we are in this, He looks at us and loves us, right? Even if we've been away for a little while, even if just somehow or another you got roped into this today, like, He looks at us and loves us. And I love that phrase, like, yes, he meets us where we are, but he loves us too much to leave us there. And in this life, he's always calling us deeper and deeper, calling us to more and more, calling us, you know, to climb the summit by first giving us the source of his body, blood, soul, and divinity to be within us, to write his law of love on our hearts, to help us to keep climbing that mountain to go towards the summit. And we're not going to be done with that until about 15 minutes after we're dead. But that's okay. And that's what makes life a glorious adventure, you know? You think about the thing, too, about the, you know, the not stealing, about Amazon. Like, we do have access to so much, right? And I'm not, like, you know, belittling, you know, some people are, are, are in want of different things. But, you know, like, if you go to a service trip in another country, you know we've got it pretty darn good here in the United States. But you also know we got a lot of poverty when it comes to something like joy. And... If you look at the fact that we do have access to that gaze of love from our Lord, this is the scary part, right? The rich, rich man. It's funny because Mark never actually calls him young. Um, he goes away sad. That's a possibility, right? I mean, any of us could do that. And I would say this too. It's always important, I think, for every one of us. I don't care if you, you know, cradle Catholic. I know my bio said cradle Catholic. I like to say Catholic since I was conceived because <laughs> when my mom was pregnant with me, my grand and they found out I was going to be a boy, my grandma declared that I would be a priest. So it was one of those things like <laughs> forever and for always, this was always like on the map, right? So 
you know, the, the prophetess that is my grandmother, Catherine O'Brien, right? Like, it was, it was coming. Um, but, you know, it's like we, we do have, like, all these different things that can draw us away. And I would say, you know, something like a sodality that's so good is to focus on the fact that we all need to be reignited in that love all the time. To stay close to him, to stay plugged in. And so if you haven't started, you know, doing any adoration ever, give it a try. Like, if you can't do the full hour, start with 15 minutes. If you can't do 15 minutes, start with five, right? To, to begin to be there, to have that loving gaze from our Lord is so important and so good. And it's one of those things that in this world, you know, nothing else can provide it. The fact that he gives everything meaning, he gives everything so much depth and glory and beauty in a way that absolutely nothing else can. And the fact of the matter is, is like he's in the midst of all this with us all the time. And I just love too, it's like just spending time with him is such a glorious thing. If I'm not mistaken, today is the summer solstice, right? Today is the day that the, the sun is shining the longest, right? At least in our hemisphere. Like it's, it's, it's out there, it's complete, it's going on. Um, it reminds me of the fact that, like what I used to say, we'd have, we had children's adoration in my parish, and there are people that would say like, you know, what are, what are they doing? What are they getting out of that? It's like, here's the thing. When you go to the beach, you may get a sunburn and not even realize what's going on. You don't know how it happened, but all of a sudden, oh, here I am. I'm Irish. I'm red. And it's crazy. But, you know, like, I wasn't paying attention, but then it happens, right? Same thing when you go in front of the true sun. You may not know exactly what's going on, right? You may not have the exact words to say. But remember, he told us in the gospel this morning, don't babble like the, like the pagans do. Like, just go and talk to your heavenly father. He gives us seven petitions. He gives us that beautiful prayer. And then talk to him from your heart. Tell him what's going on. I think sometimes we kind of fool ourselves. It's like, Father, I'm just, I'm so distracted in prayer. It's like, okay, what's the distraction? Because sometimes we got to talk to somebody from our hearts. And not just somebody, but the one who's looking at us and loving us. Who knows what we need who knows what plans he has for us. Tell him about your greatest desires. Tell him about what's frustrating you. Tell him about family members that you're having a hard time with. Beg him, you know, it's like, you know, the, the ones that have fallen away, right? We've all, we're all experiencing it. I am too. It, it hurts. It's a, it's a difficult thing. Like I said before, it's, it's easier sometimes when things happen to you than when they happen to your loved ones, right? And so to bring that to, to our Lord, to put those things, those people in his hands is such a glorious thing. Because in this world that, yes, seems angrier and angrier all the time, there's all these issues out there and we can be upset all the time, I don't think that's how we go about making things better. How do we do it? By focusing on the one who has come to fulfill the law, who has come to write the law of love on our hearts who wants us to be, you know, essentially like living monstrances, right? That we get to receive him, I mean, really and truly, into our bodies. I mean, when you stop and think about that, it's just so glorious. It reminds me of, so at my first mass, uh, you know, at, at a first mass, you typically ask someone to preach at that for you, and, and somebody vests you. It's kind of like your best men at a wedding. And the priest who preached at mine said, Father, remember, you know, when you get to go to the altar and hold up that host every day, it's not you who's holding up the hosts. It's him who's holding you up, right? And all of us together get to join into that. And I would say in an age that is so characterized by hopelessness, right? Or by anger or by just wandering and driftlessness and just all this stuff. I mean, I think we can take a cue from our good friends, the pilgrims, who are going out there and literally bringing Jesus out into the world. Now, we're not going to have a cool bus you know, with the awesome logo on the side or the monstrance inside. But that's okay. That's not a knock on you guys. I think it's awesome. But, like, we all know that we're going to go out there into the world after we're living the faith. We're practicing the sacraments. We're going to Mass. The world needs us to not be like the rich young man and go out there sad. What do we need to do? We need to trust in the fact that he's really and truly in our midst and that he wants us to bring to him everything. 
even our temptations to tell them our weaknesses, our hurts. And I mean, we'll talk more about that later on today at the healing service. But you know, there is a lot of hurt out there in the world, but we have the divine physician with us. We have our Lord whose sacred heart is on fire with love for you and for me. And the great thing is, like, this isn't just like lofty devotional talk. It's not just for some people. It's not just for the wonderful sisters across the, you know, the, the square over there, right? And they're amazing. But it's for all of us. And he looks at all of us and he loves all of us. And I would just say, my friends, like, pray for that grace not to fall into the cynicism of the world. Like, ah, oh, how is this possible? Ah, oh, the church is such a mess. Ah, oh, this person is, you know, this politician of this, what, and never, you know. We can get into all of that stuff ad nauseum. But what I would say is this, and I'm stealing this from Dr. John Bergsma, who's one of my favorite scripture scholars today. He said, we got to stop being addicted to the news and get addicted to the good news, right? Like, I really like that a lot. And he said, like, he keeps a New Testament with him. You can clap. I agree. He keeps, like, a little pocket New Testament with him. He said, so then when he's, like, waiting in line, he just pops it out and, like, reads a little bit of the gospel, right? Like, or, you know, I'm a big fan of, you know, don't go anywhere. I hope I can get it right out of my pocket. Yeah, there we go. Without your rosary, right? Pray a decade of the rosary. You know, like, there's so many things we can do to remember in the midst of this crazy world that our Lord is looking at us and loving us. And so members of the sodality, you know, remember the fact that you have people all over the place, you know, who are in this with you, and all of us together need to stay tapped into that look of love from our Lord, to keep striving to not merely, you know, check off the box of the commandments. Thanks be to God, I bet, well, hopefully I can say this, you know, like all of us are following the fifth commandment, right? Like none of us are killing people. One of my greatest um, pet peeves as a priest is when someone's like, wow, Father, I don't have to go to confession. It's not like I killed anybody or anything. Good for you. You know, it's like, I mean, ultimately, I mean, I could be wrong, but I feel like our Catholic faith calls us to be more than just not murderers, you know? So, like, if we look to go beyond that bar, right, and to let our Lord look at us and love us, like, what does that mean? He's come to fulfill the law. He's come to fulfill it in your heart. And as you live that out more and more, and this is the thing, it's not just like, okay, got that talk, now we're just good to go, right? I'm not so vain to think that's the case, right? I, I hope I did cure some of you in, of insomnia, and it's all going great. But, like, recognizing the fact that he's there, that he's there waiting for us all the time in the tabernacle, that he longs to be with us, that he wants to look at us and love us. And the more we recognize that, we're not going to fall into so many of the traps of our age, especially, like the rich man, going away sad. Ultimately, what does our Lord want from us? He wants joy, right? I have come that they may have joy and have it to the full. To be fully joy-filled. Like a St. Lawrence, right? It doesn't mean that everything's working out in the world. It was a little warm that day for St. Lawrence, and yet he still had the joy to have confidence in the fact that our Lord is risen from the dead, and he would be too. That he would be with him forever in heaven, and even right then, cling to our Lord in that very instance. My friends, we have the same opportunities. We don't just have to wait for martyrdom for that to happen. We just have to remember our Lord is with us. He is looking at us and he is loving us. And If we can take that in and take it to heart and make it a part of everything, not only do we not go away sad, but we can take the light of his love into the world and help others not to go away sad either. Praise be Jesus Christ.
earlier today, we had the opportunity to reflect on what I told you before is one of my favorite segments in all of sacred scripture, the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. And this afternoon at this beautiful healing service, I want to read the conclusion of that great chapter. So it is Mark 10, verses 46, to the end of the chapter, and it is this. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples in a great multitude, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then he rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, rise, he is calling you. And throwing off his mantle, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Master, let me receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him on the way. The Gospel of the Lord. So as we continue on in this beautiful procession and healing service, I want to begin by reflecting on shame. So, you think about shame, right? It's an interesting thing because when we use it in the right way, it's kind of like a guardrail on the highway. And I would say our pilgrims from the National Eucharistic Congress pilgrimage are probably grateful for said guardrails from time to time, right? Like a guardrail keeps you on the right path keeps you moving in the right direction. You know, as you drive down Interstate 75 South, it's nice that it's there, especially as you drive through Old Rocky Top, right? Like there are dangers on every side. And shame for us in the good sense is there to keep us on the right path, right? As I said before, when my dear friends likes to say to folks in the confessional, well, Father, I lied about this and this, but I needed to do it. And he likes to say, you know, they call someone who lies, a liar. And it's helpful because there's shame attached to certain things, right? Don't lie because then people can't trust you. There's shame attached to that. Don't steal, you'll be a robber, right? It's better not to have something than to have stolen it and to become a robber. Like, it's good to have the guardrail of shame. However, the devil, who's very tricky, who's been at this a lot longer than any one of us in this room, knows what he's doing and likes to get in there and to try to remove the shame. Oh, it's not that big of a deal. Just go to that website. Just go to that particular place. Just talk to that person. Just tell that lie. Just steal that little bit. Just lie about that golf score, right? Like all those little things. Like just, he likes to take it away. It's not a big deal. But then what happens? We drive off the road. We go down to the ditch. And this is when things get reversed. All of a sudden, the devil's been trying to take that shame away. It doesn't matter. He jumps down into the ditch. He picks up the guardrail to use it like a weapon and beats us over the head. How could you be the type of person who would do that? You can never be forgiven. God is never going to love you again. But this is where our Lord comes in to heal us of that shame to put the guardrail back where it belongs, to take it away from us, to heal us from those things, those times that we believe the lies of the devil, the same devil who tricked our first parents. Did God really say, you can't eat from any of the trees of the garden? Did he really say, you have to be one of those grumpy Catholics who's never happy? Did he really say you can never, ever have fun? That you're condemned to loneliness? Da, 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 da. He's a liar. And he's been a liar from the beginning. But thanks be to God, truth became incarnate. 
the way, the truth, the life. Our Lord is in our midst. He who is in the form of God but did not deem equality with God, something that he jealously clung to, emptied himself to come down into the ditch, right? Humbling himself to the point of death, even death on a cross, to take that guardrail of shame away, to let us be free of that shame, to get us back on the right path, right moving in the right direction again and to help us to not go back down into the ditch. Hence why we have four confessionals in this church. And there are confessionals just like tabernacles all over the world. Why? Because he wants to help us to stay on the right path. My brothers and sisters in Christ, as we look at a gospel like this, you see Bartimaeus crying out, right? And so often the devil wants to tell us, no, don't cry out. And I would say, make sure that you do, from your heart, Lord, heal me, then away from you, for this reason or that. The other people, the other group in this story that I want to point to, and this is the danger I think sometimes for us, right? That Jesus, you know, he's leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, he's calling out. And this is kind of a scandal. This is where the disciples don't look so good. As he's calling out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then he rebuked him, telling him to be silent. The scary thing in that is, these are the disciples. And my friends, at this point in Mark's gospel, Jesus has already cured a blind man. He's already risen the little girl from the dead. He's already fed thousands of people, right? They've seen amazing things that he can do. And then what do they do to Bartimaeus? Be quiet, right? It's a scary thing. As we strive to follow our Lord, as we have at times in our life been like Bartimaeus, calling out to him, having the shame removed from us in the confessional, we have to guard ourselves against ever becoming cynical, about ever taking him for granted. As we reflected this morning in the great gift of the Eucharist, he gives us this amazing gift that both calls for awe and familiarity. That here we are in this glorious church built for the greater glory of God and the salvation of souls. We should be in awe. And yet earlier today, we were able to receive in the holy sacrifice in the Mass. At this very moment, as we're all in here, quite frankly, sweaty. I know, you know, it's like I'm, I'm feeling a little gross right now. However, it's amazing that we get to be in the presence of the King in a familiar way with He who loves us so much, who has given us freedom from sin, who has come to save us from shame. And what I would say we have to make sure that we do is to not be like the disciples at the beginning of this. And thanks be to God, he doesn't give up hope on his disciples. Notice, Jesus doesn't say, okay, you knuckleheads, get out of my way. Pardon me, it's here. No. He says to those same disciples who just told Bartimaeus to be quiet, call them. My friends, we, as disciples of Jesus Christ, have the great call to do the same thing, to go out there in a world that is so wounded and overwhelmed by shame. What happens to that shame? It becomes anger. and becomes all sorts of different hopelessness. We are not left in that ditch. Our Lord has come to bring us out. And for whatever reason, He's decided to involve us as well. Just like he said to those disciples, he says to you, and he says to me, Paul. If you look at the beauty of these pilgrims of the National Eucharistic Congress, going out there to the world, we have three others that are going across the different parts of the United States. Our world needs Jesus Christ. Our world needs to be saved from the lives of the devil. Our world has the answer. It is truth incarnate. Jesus Christ, who is in our midst today. His Father comes around with the Blessed Sacrament. And for those watching at home, remember this. Our Lord is there with all of us. Be like Bartimaeus. Call out to him from your heart. Ask him to heal whatever it is that is keeping you from him. And then, beg him for the grace to be a good convert, 
to bring others to that saving grace as well. Because it's the same way that Bartimaeus, notice, after he says, Master, I want to see, and Jesus says, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately, he would see his sight and follow him on the way. My brothers and sisters in Christ, may all of us be like Bartimaeus, not just going our own way, not just falling down into the ditch, but following him who is the truth, who is the life, who is the way. Praise be Jesus Christ. Amen.